I represent the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, which is a, um, an Israeli peace and human rights organization that's dedicated to ending the Israeli occupation uh, over the Palestinians and achieving a just peace. Um, but one question is, I mean, who cares? <laughs> Why should you care about that? I mean, there's enough problems and conflicts locally, um, not to mention thousands of other ones around the world. Why this particular conflict? Why should this uh, affect us? Um, I mean, one reason is it isn't the Holy Land. I mean, I don't buy into that, to tell you the truth, but there are people that look at it as the Holy Land. So that, you know, it has, um, it has that ir irony to it, that in the, in the land that was supposed to be holy and, and uh, they're supposed to bring the Messiah and all that stuff, you've got one of the worst conflicts in the world and, in fact, a new apartheid situation in the world. Uh, beyond that, of course, it's, a, it's an issue of human rights, an issue of freedom. Um, you know, we don't live in a, in, in a Hollywood movie. And here there's an occupation lasting 47 years, an entire people, the Palestinian people, held in prison, basically. No human rights, no social rights, no uh, national rights. Uh, um, and, uh, and in fact, if, uh, if Israel prevails, if it wins, and there's a chance Israel could win, it has the support of your government, that has the support of the American government, you know, the good guys don't always, uh, 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 don't always win. There's a chance that an entire people could be in prison forever, the Palestinian people. And that sets all our values, whether they're religious values, you know, love, peace, justice, compassion, or whatever, or whether they're values of human rights and international law. If we lose there, uh, uh, it sets us all back to square one. It's very much like the anti-apartheid struggle. You, know, you can ask the question, who cares what happened at the end of Africa, um, in, 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 in South Africa? And the answer was that it sullied all of us. You know, we're all one international family. I mean, the globe is very intertwined. And, and to go to church and talk about uh, love and freedom and compassion and then, you know, and talk about human rights and so on. And then in everyday life, have a normal relationship with a racist regime in South Africa made hollow and hypocritical. All those values we're talking about. And the same is true here. If your government allows Israel to permanently imprison an entire Palestinian people, it makes all our religious and human values I think, uh, uh, irrelevant. So in, in that sense, it's as much a Canadian issue as it is, and a world issue, as it is an Israel-Palestine issue. Of course, the conflict also disrupts the entire international system. Um, it clearly disrupts the Middle East. Um, it, it, it introduces militarism, uh, polarization, alienation between uh, the, the global north, that you're a part of, and the entire Muslim world. Um, uh, it certainly destabilizes a very important geopolitical part of the world as well. John Kerry said about a month ago that we're not going to resolve the, the issues in the wider Middle East, the whole meltdown that we're having in the Middle East, without resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict. It doesn't create all the other conflicts, of course, but it's this aggravating source of alienation and militarization and polarization that prevents us from getting on and dealing with those wider problems. And it is a global conflict. It affects you in many ways. I mean, I've been in Canada now for a month. I feel at home. The whole discourse in your country is just like my country. You've basically adopted the Israeli discourse, everything is security that I've been hearing, everything is terrorism. You're going to have an election in October, maybe before, and the main electoral issue is going to be terrorism. So in other words, you're buying into this, it's coming through your government, and it's coming through Israel. 
that's very aggressive in terms of getting its framing, its case, its way. In a, in a sense, it wants to make the entire world uh, an occupation. You see, uh, human rights and freedom are threatening to Israel in general because it undermines its control. And if we can make you, us, if we can make you as paranoid about terrorism and security and the other as we are, then we'll get the support from your government that we are getting. And in addition to that, you know, there's another whole a aspect. I mean, this is, it goes on and on. You know, there's no such thing as a local conflict. These all have sources and supports and, and ramifications that go all through the world. And part of it is, of course, neoliberalism. When you have neoliberalism uh, as a dominant economy and political philosophy like you do here, or the United States or Europe, I mean, Greece just revolted against neoliberalism. You know, you have austerity budgets. The state begins to withdraw from involvement with the people. It's not responsible for the well-being of the people anymore. You have drastic cuts in social programs, education, welfare, and so on, privatization, income disparities that are huge. And in that system, as social budgets decline, you'll see a tremendous rise, not only in military budgets, but in police and security. In other words, in other words, in other words, what's happening to you is exactly what's happening to the Palestinians. You know, uh, uh, we're being Palestinianized in the sense that the, uh, the ruling classes, the corporations, those that run the world uh, are afraid of, uh, you know, what happens when you have income disparities? What happens when you have an occupied Wall Street movement? What happens when you have protests against the G8? And so you begin to have repression. I've been here for a month, and I've seen changes in, in, the, in the uniforms your police wear. Your police used to wear police uniforms. Now they're wearing paramilitary, uh, soldier, army-type uniforms. The weapons they're carrying are already army weapons, not police. In other words, they're seeing you as potential threats or terrorists, not as citizens to be protected. So in all, in, in that, and Israel feeds into that. So you've got, for example, in 2006, your Minister of Public Safety, Stockwell Day, signed an agreement with, with the Israeli government, with our Minister of Internal Security, an agreement that's called the Canada-Israel Public Safety Agreement. Public safety is internal. It's not military. It's, and Israel has been invited into Canada. Now, this is eight years ago. I don't know where it's gotten because nobody knows about it. Israel's been invited in to run your, partly to run your prison systems, to, run, to, to supervise and, uh, your border, uh, 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 supervise your borders, uh, to, work, to train your police forces to introduce all kinds of security systems that are perfected on the Palestinians in your cities, to work in your airports. Um, in other words, Israel has, is coming into the heart of your, of your sovereignty. And it's supporting the state in terms of security on the one hand, but the whole language that's being used is an Israeli language. Terrorism, security, you know, statistically, this is, and it's, this is true, statistically, you have a better chance of getting killed by a lightning bolt than you do in a, by a terrorist act. And yet terrorism becomes the center of the public discourse. So this conflict, I think, is something to relate to, not only because of the local issue of occupation and... Uh, and um, uh, and, the, and the plight of the Palestinians and its implications for the wider Middle East, but because it does go out and affect the, the entire global community. It is a Canadian issue as much as it's an Israeli issue. So this is a map of Israel-Palestine, and we can kind of begin here. This is a map of what we call the two-state solution. 
In other words, this whole conflict that's oppressive to the Palestinians, disruptive of the Middle East, disruptive of the international system, has an easy, almost agreed upon solution. It shouldn't be one of the major global conflicts in the world. And that's what's called the two-state solution. And the concept is simple. The idea is that this is one country. Uh, the um, uh, Jews call it the land of Israel. Palestinians call it Palestine. Religious people call it the Holy Land. Not the only Holy Land, but <laughs> one of the Holy Lands. And, and, uh, but whatever you call it, it's one country. And in this one country, there's two peoples. There's, there's a Palestinian Arab people, and there's, a, a, uh, uh, and there's a, uh, an Israeli Jewish people. One of the interesting things is that, you know, because the whole issue of indigeneity, who's an aboriginal, um, uh, is a political issue in our, in our, it's not agreed upon. Because the Palestinians say, we're the indigenous people. We go back, we're the, we're the Arabs, we're the Romans, we're the Greeks, we're the Byzantines, we're the Crusaders, we're the Muslims, we're the Canaanites, we're the Jews. Uh, all the peoples that have ever lived in this country for the last 10,000 years have all mixed and come and gone and so on. And we're the people here that have been here all these, all these centuries. Whereas the Israeli, the, the Jews come and say, no, 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 no. Canaanites are gone. We kind of wiped them out in the Bible. The, God gave us this land. It belongs to us. There's nobody else. And you're Arabs. You're not indigenous. You're Arabs from somewhere else that came. We're the indigenous. So that's a very interesting, you know, this issue is very important here in Canada. The uh, aboriginal rights and, and, and history and so on. But there it's very much uh, an issue. And I have to say, Israel's very clever. Israel works a lot with the aboriginal peoples here, the First Nations here in Canada. And there are many First Nation leaders who have come to Israel who have been convinced that the Israeli Jews are the actual aboriginals and not the Palestinians. So again, you know, Israel finds every thread in order to make its case. Uh, so the whole issue of who is an aboriginal uh, in this country is, I mean, you go, I would like to say it's a tie. And we're, and we're all aboriginals, but that's really a part of the political discourse. At any rate, um, you've got this one country, and today there's two peoples living there, Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. So the idea of the two-state solution is simple. Let's, there's two peoples. Each people claims the right of self-determination. Each people wants a state of its own. So let's divide the country. Now, if you look at the map, you see the division isn't exactly equal. I mean, this is Israel, which is on 78% of the country of historic Palestine. 78% is Israel and what's called the occupied territory. The Palestinian territories occupied by Israel in 1967 in the Six-Day War represent only 22% of historic, historic Palestine. The West Bank, which is the West Bank of the Jordan River. East Jerusalem, which is where the old city is, where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is, which is the holiest place in Christianity, where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is, which is one of the holiest mosques in Islam, um, in East Jerusalem, and Gaza, the Gaza Strip. That's been in the news because it's been attacked so many times. So those represent the occupied territory. The idea being, OK, we'll have these two states. That we'll have the state of Israel and alongside of it a Palestinian state. Now, it's not a fair and just solution. You know, in this country today, half the population is Palestinian. And, and there's 5 million Palestinian refugees from 1948, from when this whole 
mess began that live around the country. So if even some of the refugees return, there will be a Palestinian majority in this country. And yet the Palestinians have said to Israel, we will make peace with you for less than a quarter of the land, even though we're going to be the majority people. In fact, the Palestinians accepted this two-state solution in 1988, 27 years ago. The Palestinians said to Israel, we recognize you. And as I've been traveling around Canada, um, there's been an acknowledgement that we're on unceded land of different groups and uh, Treaty One lands and, uh, you know, from the different, from the different uh, indigenous groups. I come from a country on ceded Aboriginal land. The Palestinians, who are the indigenous people, have said, we cede 78% of our country to Israel. I mean, that's something unprecedented in the colonial world. There's never been a colonized people that have said, we give up political claim to 78% of our country. And, and we'll do that for the sake of peace and to get a small state for ourselves on 22% of our country. That's unprecedented. And instead of getting credit for that, for bending over more than backwards to, to acknowledge Israel, make peace with Israel, the Palestinians have gotten clobbered over the head by your government and by every other government. They're terrorists, they're, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're anti-Western, they're anti-us, and, uh, and, and Israel's a good guy. Israel's a democratic state. The Palestinians are the terrorists. Israel is um, our ally. Uh, the Palestinians are part of our enemies. And, uh, and Israel becomes the victim. Here you've got a state on 78% of the country, the fourth largest nuclear power in the world, a military ally of Canada that trains your army and police, an occupying power, and Israel's the victim. And the Palestinians who live under, under uh, occupation for 47 years with no human rights, no civil rights, they're the perpetrators. They're the bad guys. So you can see how the whole thing has been turned on its head. Um, so nevertheless, the two-state solution is the accepted solution by most parties. It was accepted by the Palestinians, like I said, 27 years ago. It's been accepted by the entire Arab League in 2002 in what was called the Arab Peace Initiative, where the entire Arab world said to Israel, if you relinquish the occupied territory, we will not only make peace with you, we'll integrate you into the region. The two-state solution is the solution of Canada on paper. It's the solution of the United States. It's a solution approved by the UN. Everybody agrees. So what's the problem? Why are we sitting here? <laughs> Because there's one holdout, and that holdout is Israel. Israel, from 1967 until today, in every government, has said no. No. This is our country. This is all the land of Israel, and we want it all. And not only that, but there is no Palestinian people. Israel has never, ever, ever recognized the existence of a Palestinian people. So Israel says there's no such thing as the Palestinian people. There's a bunch of Arabs here, but they don't add up to a collectivity, a nation with national rights like we do. Um, there is no occupation. Israel denies there's an occupation. Israel says, look, this is all our country. How can you occupy your own country? And so from Israel's point of view, uh, the Arabs can either, and we use the word Arabs, because if there's no Palestinians, we're not going to call them Palestinians. We don't want to recognize that national entity. So we talk about Arabs in a very undifferentiated way. The idea being, if the Arabs want to stay in our country, in our country, they, they have to submit. 
They have to forget about being Palestinians. They have to forget about a two-state solution. They have to forget about negotiations. We're not going to negotiate with them. If they submit, if as Arabs they accept that they're living in a Jewish country, we'll let them stay. If they don't submit, they got two options. They can leave or they can die. That's it. And that's, in a sense, the Israeli approach. But it's not enough just to assert that. Because, you know, there's political pressures. This is, a, a, like I said, a regional, global conflict. There might be pressures on Israel to concede. After all, this is really endangering the entire world system. So in order to make its occupation or its, its control permanent, to make it immune from any outside pressures, Israel has laid over the occupied territory. This is the West Bank and, and East Jerusalem laid over the occupied territory, what I call a matrix of control. In other words, facts on the ground, that's what Israel calls them, that are so massive and so permanent and so destroy any coherent Palestinian territory that basically they eliminate the two-state solution. And they make, it they make it irreversible. They make it impossible to negotiate uh, a Palestinian state because, because there is no more territory for a Palestinian state. It's all been, the word we use in Israel is Judaized. We've Judaized, in other words, we're taking the entire country of Palestine and we're making it Israel. With the Arabs either leaving or, or living in the nooks and crannies of our country. So what Israel's done, for example, is to fragment Palestinian territory. There is no coherent West Bank and Gaza anymore. The Palestinians have all been shoved into what we call areas A and B of the West Bank. This is area A, the darker brown areas are A, and the lighter brown beige areas are called B. And these are supposedly under the authority of the Palestinian Authority, headed by Mahmoud Abbas or Abu Mazen, but in fact it's just on paper. Israel invades it. Well, there is no real Palestinian authority at all, but areas A and B are where the Palestinians are confined. In other words, they're all evicted or displaced from the gray areas here, plus these pinkish areas that are area C, which is under complete Israeli control, the 62% of the occupied territory under Israeli control. And uh, so people have been pushed out of Area C into these little islands, plus Gaza, which is, uh, which is a cage. You can't enter Gaza, you can't leave Gaza. It's a cage. So we can say then this. 95% of the Palestinians have been... Conf and, and, all right, A, B, and Gaza represent 38% of the occupied territory, Israel controlling the other 62%. So we can say that 95% of the Palestinians have been locked into 38% of 22% of their country. And that uh, fragmented into all kinds of little islands. Um, so that, you know, and you have here, I know, in, I think in Canada, reservations, I, I think with the First Nations reservations, and their situation is, is, is not good. Here you've got that same situation, sort of reservations, no economy, no territorial contiguity, uh, no resources, no water. But here, the indigenous people also have no citizenship. You can, you can be a First Nation, but you have Canadian citizenship. Here, you're a First Nation Palestinian living in these little islands with no citizenship. You're stateless. You can't even travel. You don't have a, you're not Israeli, you're not Jordanian, and you're not Palestinian. There's no Palestinian passport. 
So you're locked into a place with no, you're stateless and rightless and, and basically powerless. So that's part of it. It's been fragmented. The Palestinians confined. And then in Area C, under Israeli control, you see all these blue blotches around. These are all the settlements. There's 200 Israeli settlements, cities, towns, villages. 600,000 Israelis live in the occupied territory. In, in four years, we're going to have a million Israelis in the occupied territory. And of course, Area C completely surrounds all the Palestinian areas. Look how tiny some of these little islands are. You see, and they're all, they're all surrounded by um, uh, not only settlements, but surrounded by checkpoints. In other words, 600 checkpoints completely encircle areas A and B. And that's where Israel gets the biometrics and the surveillance techniques that it brings into your airports. You know, I've, I've heard about the Nexus card you have in Canada all based on biometrics. I haven't been able to do research yet, but I, I would not be surprised if there was an Israeli firm behind the biometrics of your Nexus cards. And they're very dangerous cards. You know, all your biometric data is in a centralized data bank. It's very nice, you can walk through here and here in airports and do this and that, but you're monitored and they know exactly where you are and I wouldn't be surprised, it's worth looking into, whether or not nice systems, how's that for a word? Nice systems is the main Israeli surveillance company, a multi-billion dollar company, coming out of the Israeli army, out of intelligence gathering, that, that is behind these kinds of cards. So literally, you're carrying the same kinds of cards that Palestinians do, and I don't know who runs a data bank. I mean, these are all very dangerous things that we're not very aware of. At any rate, that's where this stuff develops. 600 checkpoints where you have millions of Palestinians going through every day. In other words, the control of Area C over these Palestinian islands is really direct and very stark. Um, and then, of course, you've got a whole network of highways that, that completely integrate, incorporate the West Bank into Israel. 28 major highways, many of which are off limits to Palestinians. These are not highways for the most part that Palestinians can drive on, and they're highways that anyway go to the settlements. And so the West Bank has been incorporated into Israel, and so I would argue, in fact, that there is no more two states or a possibility of two states. In fact, Israel has already made this one state. There's only one authority, one government, one army, one water system, one currency throughout the entire country. And we'll come back to the implications of that. So what Israel's trying to do, and here's where house demolitions comes into play, is trying to displace the Palestinians, to shove them into areas A and B, or force them out of the country completely.